This is Johnny with Tiger Bomb MMA, and today I'm going over UFC Fight Night Lemos versus Janjaroba, giving you my thoughts and predictions on the entire 12 bout card. It's taking place at the Apex in Vegas. Really, the only thing I really like about this whole event is their poster. I like the pinks and the purples, my kind of bag. Overall, kind of a lackluster main event. Um, there's a couple good spots here that I like betting wise, which I'll talk to you in a bit. But overall, I'm not too enthusiastic about this one. Um, yeah, I'll give you my thoughts on this. Uh, before I do that, sorry for not being enthusiastic about this card. Like, I'm gonna rush through it because it is what it is. But back to the Denver card here, the Nama Yunus versus Cortez card. I'm gonna give you my thoughts on that. Overall, I went essentially 50%. I went six out of 12. I do count the Razak as a knockout win, even though it was a no contest, because I don't think anyone's going to argue me with me on that one. But uh, I didn't bet anything significant. I probably bet like 100 bucks on some random live betting shit. Very tough card to actually make money on. I know some people did, but a lot of people didn't. And th there were some controversial decisions here and there, especially on the, on the main card. Uh, but overall, I think I had some good reads. But if I'm being honest with you, I do, I do think that the elevation kind of messed with me with over analysis. It, it almost seems like everyone's cardio held up just fine except for one dude. And that one dude would have been uh, Darius Flowers. I actually bet Darius, and this is what I meant, like really dumb live bets. He was like fucking plus 300 or something like that. I'm like, I'll put 25 bucks on him. He made me look like a chump. But then again, he was... Uh, Kind of made himself look like a chump. I actually picked Elder, but didn't really talk about it because he wasn't actually on the card when I did the breakdown. Handled him pretty easily. His cardio looked good. Darius, I expected him to at least look pretty good in the first round, maybe even potentially get a knockout because Elder's chin isn't necessarily like made out of granite. And yeah, he just pussied out. Uh, Petrosky pretty much did exactly what I thought he was going to do. He's just going to out-grapple Fremd, whose takedown defense is kind of shit. He needs his takedowns to actually do anything i think his striking gets better when there's a threat of a takedown and in this case there was no real threat uh santos defeats agapova which was depressing because i like agapova so i am curious now what agapova is going to do for a means of income so i might have to hit her up and i've got plenty of hundred dollar bills to give her montel jackson defeats blackshear very easily i actually had a parlay with blackshear and another guy on the card I really, really, really thought Blackshear was going to put up a decent fight, but the props is that Montel Jackson actually showed his true potential here. I was expecting to see the old lazy Jackson where he's just like, well, this guy's got my back. What am I going to do here? But to his credit, he knocked him out quick. Blackshear didn't even have a chance to start his like wrestling problem with Blackshear not starting his wrestling early is that he wanted to prove his striking he threw a lazy leg kick got knocked the fuck out first time he's ever been finished like that period so kind of nuts that shows you the power and the true potential of Montel Jackson uh Jazz Divisius defeats Klein I wanted to bet Jazz Divisius with whatever I had left like 75 bucks yeah she was already a, a pretty good favorite like minus 130 she handled Klein easily I thought I, I thought Klein had some good moments in there it did show that she is a very good prospect but just undersized she'll be back Charles Johnson defeats Joshua Van now I did bet Johnson live I don't want to get into the schematics as to why I did that because I actually thought Van was going to win um, essentially I bet him before the fight started at like plus 200 I thought it was going to be an easy way for me to make like five bucks because I expected him to win the first round which he was winning until, I guess, Josh made it really close at the end. So he was then, like, plus 400. So I'm like, fuck it, I guess I'm riding with Charles Johnson and see what happens here. Josh was picking him apart in the second round, pressuring him, making Charles very uncomfortable. And then third round comes out, Charles is like a bat out of hell, knocks him out with a really good place punch, and then an uppercut. It sucks because Van was looking really good. He was looking like... This kid's going to go places. It's a minor setback, in my opinion, because I, I think I think the way he was handling Charles Johnson, and this was split down the middle. I mean, like, it was going to be a split decision for either guy, and it would have gone to Josh had he not got knocked out. I, I think he would have put on the pressure, eventually slowed down Charles Johnson. 
I see the talent in Joshua, and I think he's only going to get better from here on out. It's going to be tough for Charles Johnson moving forward because he is going to be getting tougher opponents. Probably they're going to feed him to Tadir Olimbekov if he can make weight. But yeah, props to both men. I made a little bit of money on Charles Johnson. Like, what? I, I put 25 bucks on him, so I made like 50 bucks. Um, don't worry, I lost it. Um, Cody Brundage did his Brundage dance where he he's perfectly fine, right? And then he's like, oh, where am I? Who am I? I just pictured him doing like a dramatic Shakespeare. Uh, I would imitate it, but I don't want to. I don't want to give him any more time. Uh, Julian Arosa defeats Christian Rodriguez. Rodriguez was looking good, but what I was worried about the most, and I'll tell you, man, I did a ton of little bits of research with Rodriguez. I went back and watched all the small dudes that knocked out Erosa, which was like Tetsu, Tetsuhara, I believe. I forgot his name. The Japanese guy that loves bitches. Julio Arce, and Arce I thought was going to have a similar game plan, or Rodriguez would have a similar game plan to Arce, just kind of outbox him against the cage, just be the quicker, faster guy. I think that the the mean mugging of Erosa and his size made Christian panic, because I've never seen him that anxious inside the pocket like that before, and he made a really bad mistake. He defended the, the back take very well, and then he got on top of Julian, which was like, dude, you could have just let him back up. You were winning the round. And then he got caught. He essentially put himself in that in that guillotine choke. So it's a good learning lesson for Rodriguez, but I hope to God he drops to 135. Erosa, he's going to continue to be this guy that's going to cost a ton of people money because he will probably be a favorite his next time out or maybe a closer dog. And he will underperform or he will overperform. That, that tends to happen here. So... He is a guy that can get knocked out by dudes with zero knockouts on their record and or submit or knock out dudes that have promising careers. So he's just one of these guys that I should probably stay away from betting for or against ever again. Moving on, Gabriel Bonfin defeats Ang Lusa. Lusa proved that he has a good skill set, but he is nothing particularly special. I think he's going to be a very good middle-of-the-road uh, welterweight where he can beat a ton of inexperienced welterweights he can style on these guys but the more talented folk like the brian battles the gabriel bonfemes will beat him and in this case bonfeme he showed that he can go all five or all three rounds i should say he has been five but or has he no nah, whatever I'm, I'm overthinking it but yeah he can go the whole three rounds he can establish a jab his jab was looking really good his cardio looked good he was jumping for guillotine a little too much but i don't blame him uh, Lusa, though, just kind of stiff-necked him. Uh, overall, pretty good performance from Gonfine. I'm not I'm not too upset at it. Uh, John Silva defeats Drew Dober. Now, this fight here, this is the fight where I was over-analyzing the shit out of it. It was a dead pick -em. Then it became Dober, slight underdog. Initially, when I first heard about it, like, John Silva's going to wreck Drew Dober. But then I'm like, oh, no, it's at elevation, short notice, up a weight class versus a power puncher. And I even said, like, Drew is a guy who gives one to get or gets one to give one. And that's not the best strategy against a really good and powerful striker, especially one his similar size. Then I overthought it. I'm like, oh, no, then Drew Dober's had this full camp. John Silva might slow down in the second round. And that's where I was the most impressed with Silva, not the fact that he finished Drew Dober. Like, I kind of thought that was a possibility. The fact that he, on short notice, on, on seven days in elevation, fought all three rounds essentially he, he won all three rounds uh, particularly but his cardio held up and him being that dynamic and that explosive was like oh shit this guy's going to be a major problem and either weight class lightweight or featherweight if he can make featherweight and continue to make featherweight there's going to be a big problem at featherweight but yeah props to silva props to dober they they went at it it was a great fight uh muslim salikov defeated santiago ponzinibbio and also, Drew Dober was the guy I had with uh, Blackshear that cost me. So double loss there for me. Ponzinibbio. So I took Salikov um, money line pre-fight. He was like plus one something. Same thing I did with Charles Johnson. I'm like, yo, I think Muslim's going to win the first round. And then maybe cash out if Ponzinibbio starts taking over. That never happened because Salikov was like plus 200 up into the second round. And I thought he won the first round. And then the second round, I still thought 
well, a Muslim won that one. And I kept seeing his line go up. I even saw online people took him, excuse me, people took him at like plus 2,000, plus 1,000, and I never got that line. I would have jumped all over it. I picked Ponzinibbio, and I can tell you as a judge myself, I thought it was two rounds to zero up into the third round, which I thought Ponzinibbio barely stole. And um, yeah, if you if you see that kind of stuff, and I wish I had legitimate money to actually bet Salikov live and not like just pissing around and, and joking, I, I would have loved to do that. But I really wanted to stay away from this card seriously. Um, but yeah, if you took that money live on, on Salikov props on you, I mean, I, I made like, I didn't make anything because whatever I, I actually bet and won on Salikov, I blew on Tracy Cortez by sub. Um, yeah, Tracy did not look good. She couldn't wrestle, she couldn't strike. She looked completely outmatched. She didn't look like she belonged there. Her cardio didn't look bad. And that's because she didn't, in my eyes, try hard enough. She didn't really, she seemed like she didn't want to be there. I'm like, why would you take this fight if you didn't want to be there? That's my impression of it. She did take her back in the second round. And I'm like, oh shit, if she gets like a rear naked choke or something or some or some top control, this could lead to me like having the most epic, I fucking told you so. That never happened. Um, she she just seemed completely outmatched. He, when she had the back, she just didn't give a shit about the control. She lost control. The fact that Rose was able to take her down repeatedly with the same takedown was to me like, ooh, utter embarrassment. And I know Tracy's takedown defense isn't like top tier, but for Rose to be able to do that to you every single time, I know Rose is a former champ, but I think the performance of Rose was more of Tracy looking that bad. That's just my opinion. Um, with Rose having a two-fight win streak currently, I, I think it's more the opponent in this case that made her look that good. I hate to do that to Rose because I do like Rose, but I'm being honest. So like an unprepared Tracy Cortez who didn't really want to be there, of course, is going to make you look fantastic. And I do think that Rose, if she does get a, a much tougher, more legitimate opponent like a Macy Barber, I think Macy would have given her a really tough fight because Macy wouldn't have taken that shit. Macy would not allow herself to get taken down like that and not like fight out of it. So those are my thoughts on that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't do great, but I'll learn from this. Again, luckily, I didn't bet too much money on this other than like 100 bucks, which I lost. It is what it is, but I am looking to make some money on this upcoming card. Let me get to the right screen. Also, I'm using OSB for the like second time, so I'm not fully used to it. I typically use um, StreamYard. So if you're out there and you're deciding, hey, I want to do what Johnny does and have terrible takes on the internet, you can use StreamYard. It's all right, but it's like down. OSB is kind of neat, but it's a little bit more complicated. So anyways, Janjiroba versus Lemos. Let's get started. First fight of the night, we've got Muhammad Usman versus Thomas Peterson. Usman is plus 150. The comeback on Peterson is did I say plus minus 150, plus 125 for Peterson the train. I think train here, Thomas the train is going to be a train wreck because I don't think he belongs in the UFC. I think he kind of got gifted the opportunity to be in the UFC, he kind of snuck his way in by beating, uh, I was going to say Garrett Cole, Can Chandler Cole, uh, essentially a fat, lightweight. Um, his boxing's not great. He, he does have good wrestling. But I just don't think he's got that physicality to fight these guys like Usman, who he's not the best heavyweight. I honestly think this is a very, very few times that Usman is just better than his opponent everywhere, except maybe pure wrestling. But for MMA wrestling, I think it's a solid enough. He's minus 150 here. I'm actually considering playing him significantly. I just don't see a way he loses. I think he's got, obviously, the reach advantage. He's a much better striker. He's fought much better competition to an extent. I think Peterson is a very good regional fighter. Uh, honestly, he could bear to lose some weight, maybe drop down the light heavyweight. Even then, I just don't think he's athletic enough. He does, again, have great wrestling. He's been training with um, Gabe Stevenson, heavyweight wrestling champ. I don't see him controlling Usman for three rounds or even two rounds to win this. I can see Usman knocking him out. I can see Usman just being much faster and more physical. 
I see Usman even outpointing him striking. I think that's what Usman does best. He just throws. He overwhelms dudes sometimes. He's a solid enough heavyweight. He is, to me, the new Arlovsky. As long as he doesn't get knocked out, he can definitely weasel his way to a, to a decision here. His last fight, he even hurt Mick Parkin, who I think Mick Parkin's better than obviously both of these guys, but it shows the level of like speed and power that he possesses. So to me, I'm going to go with Mohamed Usman to win this one by a decision. So I do like Usman in this spot. And again, I might actually end up betting this dude. But we'll see what happens. I'm not uh, quite sure yet because the line here says that it's uh, minus 150. I don't know what it's going to be at the casino when I go. Next fight, we've got Luana Carolina versus Lucy Pudilova. Minus 120 for Pudilova. Come back on Carolina plus 100. To keep it brief, I'm going to go with Pudilova. Not as a confident pick. She's on a two-fight losing streak opposed to Carolina, who's on a two-fight winning streak. Those two fights that she won are against pretty shit competition. Granted, I do think she's improved. Her, her striking's a lot better. Her takedown's a lot better. She's more athletic as a striker than Carolina. I'm sorry, than Pudilova. But Pudilova, when she does get takedowns, I, I've always found that her striking's kind of been mid. She's very slow. She's just like a Euro kickboxer. Very meat and potatoes, but when she... Moved to SBG, she started getting takedowns and reigning ground and pound. I was super impressed by that. That is, to me, her true calling in MMA. If she can do that to Luana, get her down, which may or may not be a task because the women that have been trying to take down Luana aren't really that good. Uh, to me, it's like a dog or pass, but stylistically, if Pudalova can get those takedowns, just mush her down to the ground, she should win this one more than likely by a submission or a TKO in the second round. I've never truly been impressed with Carolina, but if I'm being honest, as of late, it's been like the progress of her that's been intriguing to me. If she can beat Pudilova, we will see. I'll have to reassess her. But when I see her fights, like I've always been kind of like, ah, she's all right. She's lackluster. She's one of these girls that they got into the UFC just to like feed to girls like, you know, uh, what's her name? She got knee barred by her. Uh, not McCann, not Wood. I forgot her name. Uh, Lipsky, there you go. The Lipskys of the world. She got knocked out by McCann, and then she's been beating two cans in a row. Am I supposed to think she's not shit? She's getting better to like not lose to these losers. I actually even beat Storlyanko, bet Storlyanko to beat her. And there were moments there where she was getting nearly subbed, but she she's handling herself well, but Storlyanko only has like one literally one round of gas. I'm going with Pudilova, second round TKO. Next bout, we've got Loic Radzibov versus Trey Ogden. Radzibov minus 150, Ogden plus 125. I went back and forth on this one, mainly because I'm like, well, is Loic going to gas out and give up easy takedowns after round number one? Round number one, Loic is fucking bad out of hell. He hits hard, good wrestling, good hips. Carries a lot of muscle, does tend to kind of gas himself out. Dre Ogden, he's a, he's a mystery. He's, he's an epic stifler when it comes to your game plan. He has a good jab. He trains at his own gym at Marathon. He has guys like um, Garrett Armfield. Really, Garrett, I believe, is the one that's been helping his, his boxing out a lot. And he's okay. He's, he's got a really good lead hand. I'll give him that. But everything else is just kind of lackluster. He does have the reach advantage by three inches the power will go to Radzibov the wrestling advantage is is tricky I think they kind of negate each other but Trey does give up pretty easy takedowns himself it, it just really varies on if Radzibov is going to be at the end of that jab or is he going to just pressure Ogden against the cage make him uncomfortable make him shoot for a takedown that's going to get stuffed where Radzibov's just going to unload on him that's kind of what I'm leaning towards like Trey when you disrespect his striking and you can stuff the takedowns, you can kind of put him in a predicament where he's just like there to get hit. And that's what I've kind of noticed. And when you aren't particularly the better striker and he's just like keeping you at bay with that annoying jab and he can get takedowns on you because you're not expecting them because you're like, ah, oh, fuck, he's going to jab me again. And then you rush in to try to hit him and he takes you down. That's when he has the most success. So that's why I'm worried so much about betting rods above here. At minus 150, I will take him to win this. 
uh, man, I think he can get a TKO. He's never been TKO'd Ogden, that, that is. He's been submitted before. But I don't know if he's ever been hit like Loic can hit him. So I'm going to say round number two. I mean, even what I'm most worried, honestly, is that I do think even Trey can knock out Radzibov because I don't think he's going to see it coming. He even got hit by Al Sawadi. I call him Al Safradi. People actually thought he was going to beat Radzibov, then he got knocked out into another century. Ooh, boy. I'll just say this, right? I'm going to pick Radzibov to win, but if he gasses out, trying to finish Ogden, and Ogden just gets him down, and he gets tired, and he can't get back up, I'm going to be very pissed if I have money on, on Radzibov. So I'm going to go Radzibov. Fuck, I'll go round number one. Now, I'm not confident in that. I think that Radzibov, at the end of the day, can win this by a decision if he can make Trey uncomfortable. But it, it's a good fight. It's a good fight between two guys that can wrestle. Uh, one is not necessarily the most intimidating. The other guy has like a nuclear option in his punches, but he tends to lose at lose lose steam. But yeah, I'll go with Radzibov by TKO in the first round. Next bout, we've got Miranda Maverick versus Dione Barbosa. Barbosa plus 170, which is interesting. This is automatically a dog or pass because Maverick is a minus 205. I don't think she should be minus 205, mainly because she is the smaller girl. I think the more talented of the two. I think Barbosa's uber dependent on the takedown. She has good jiu-jitsu for a black belt off of her back. She can get arm bars, etc. But I think Maverick is crafty enough. I think she's strong enough, smart enough to be able to defend any sort of attacks off of the back. I think she can get takedowns on Diana Barbosa. I think she can avoid getting her back taken. I think she might even be the better, quicker striker with a better diversity. It's just that when I see Miranda Maverick fight, my biggest worry with her is that she's five foot three. She's kind of small and bigger girls. And not to say that Barboza is that much bigger, but bigger girls can lay on her. Uh, Barboza, I've never been impressed by her striking. She, again, is super dependent on getting the takedown. To me, she should not be going to a third round with a rookie in Ernesta Caracate. I, I, essentially, she should have finished this rookie, but I saw something in that rookie that gave me the impression that she could actually beat Barbosa, which near the end of the fight, she was kind of putting her on uh, on notice there with, with the punches, and she was kind of gassed out. I will go with Maverick to win this one by a decision, but I, I do think that there's a good chance that Barbosa might be able to get a submission here against Maverick. And what I say when I say might is that with these submissions with these women, if you go all out for it, it's just a matter of inches, right? I, I think that Maverick has done so much good work on the mat. She, she can even submit Barbosa, but sometimes a matter of inches with an arm bar, which these women love to go for the arm bar, can be the, the defining factor. And if Barbosa can get it early, she can really put a halt to this win streak for, for Maverick. So I will go with Maverick still. I think she's still very, very well rounded. Again, I just worry that she's going to be a little too small. Moving on, we've got Brian Kelleher versus Cody. Gibson, let's go back down here. Fucking OSB, not used to it. Uh, minus 230 for Gibson, automatically a hell no. Uh, come back on Kelleher, plus 190. I will tell you very quickly, I'm going to go with Kelleher to win this one by a decision. The reason for it is that for Cody Gibson, I've come to the conclusion that it is perhaps his time at 19 and 9 with a total record. He should not be a minus 230 favorite. It, it, it insults me that he's a favorite over Brian Kelleher. Um, mainly because Kelleher possesses a certain type of quality that has generally given Cody Gibson some fits. And to me, Cody Gibson is kind of notorious for looking really good in certain fights, like the Ray Borg fight. He fought Ray Borg, former UFC lightweight, and um, no, I'm sorry, not lightweight, former UFC fucking fly. There's a fly in the room. Former UFC featherweight and then ballooned up 135-er. And he was looking really good against him. He was, like, dominating him up until the point where that second round happened. And Cody just essentially fell off the fucking cliff. I don't know if it was because his size just depleted him so much that he, he just didn't have enough cardio. Fuck. Or it was that those takedowns, repeated takedowns from Ray Borg just took it out of him. And he was giving up these takedowns. He ended up losing that fight. He came into the UFC via the Ultimate Fighter, and I'm like, yo, he's he's back. You know, he's gotten through those issues. 
He's still making weight, but I feel like he's just depleting himself. He should be moving up to 145. I think he loves having that size advantage, which he's going to have over Brian Kelleher. What? Jesus, like four inches in height and a significant reach advantage here. 64 over 71 for Cody Gibson. But what I do like about Kelleher, my saving grace with him is that, yeah, he's lost three in a row, been finished three in a row, but he's been finished by former champions, uh, a guy who might be contending for the title in Nurmagomedov, and a, and a kind of a, a potential dark horse in Mario Bautista, who have just been beating his ass and ragdolling him. None of those guys are anywhere near that bottom league that Cody Gibson is. And it's crazy to say like, oh, wow, I'm going to put all this money on Cody Gibson to beat Brian Kelleher, a guy who's only lost to either a champion as of late, a future title challenger who's fighting the number one contender in Umar, and a guy that might be contending for the title in the next, say, three or four years if he still stays on that steady rise versus Cody fucking Gibson, a guy at the end of his rope. I don't see that. Yeah, can Cody come out here and maybe submit Brian? Yeah, Brian's been submitted plenty of times. Brian's got a good guillotine of his own. His wrestling looked actually very good against this guy similar to Cody Gibson in, uh, why am I forgetting Kevin Kroom? The Cuckmeister, Kevin Kroom. Oh, poor Gina Mazzani. I can't believe that <laughs> fucking bit. Anyways, with, uh, with Kelleher, he ragdolled him. In the first round, uh, Kroom was just kind of out landing and voluming up Brian Kelleher up until he took him down and he started dominating the dude. I feel like he can do the same thing to Cody Gibson. I think at 135, uh, it's a healthier weight for Brian Kelleher. He doesn't have as much power or, as I call it, boom, like boom, at uh, 135 as he should at 145. I think 145 is just a better power for uh, Brian Kelleher, but he's just too undersized. In this case, I think he's going to be landing the hardest shots. He's going to be able to mix in the takedowns, just being more of a powerful guy. Just has to avoid getting submitted or possibly knocked out by Cody Gibson. I think after it's that second round, Cody might fall off that cliff. And I, I'm even going to predict this. I don't even think Cody's going to make weight. I think, man, he's 36 years old. He's five foot one. I think he's just a little too big at this point of his career for 135 at bantamweight. He's just malnourished. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens here, but I don't think I'm crazy to say I'll take a plus 190 Brian Kelleher midget over a depleted Skeletor and, and Cody Gibson. But yeah, let me know what your thoughts are on this one. Next bout, uh, Hyder Emil versus Jong Yong Lee. I like me some Jong Yong Lee here, mainly because he is a Korean tiger and uh, we are very tiger friendly here. But the reason I'm taking Lee, I'm taking him by knockout in the second round, I should add he is minus 185, come back on a meal plus 155. I like me some Emil, very much so. I, I really do because he is uber tough. He is uh, Giblert Melendez's protege, and if you don't know who Giblert Melendez is, do your, your research, boys and gals. Dude fights out of the scrap pack. The dude is tough. The dude moves forward, but he's 34 years old, and he leaves a lot of openings with that constant pressure. And when I mean this guy is tough, if you go back and you watch his LFA fight with um, Chase Gibson, the dude has a rear naked choke on Emil, dead to rights. Like, he is on his back, Emil standing up, he's got the choke in, and you see him fighting for dear life as he's running out of oxygen. It is... Very impressive. And then in his contender series fight, he fought tooth and nail with that guy. I forget his name, um, Sanmez, where he was getting taken down. He kept getting back up. They were both exhausted, but he showed his grit and determination. And then he beat the absolute shit out of Fernie Garcia. Is it Fernie Garcia? Yeah, I, I always consider him being Fernie Fernandez, which doesn't make sense, Fernie Fern. But Emil did get dropped by for Fernand Fernandez Fern Fernie Garcia damn it I did it again Fernie even put him in a rear naked choke and to me that shows that um he has a ton of striking openings that I think Jung Young Lee is going to capitalize on Jung Young Lee is the taller dude by an inch he's going to have what a three inch reach advantage on top of that he is uber dynamic I do think these young Korean fighters are just getting a lot better with his striking with his takedown defense that was displayed against Blake Builder, and I will say I picked Builder to beat him. I even played a uh, Yazi to beat him. And granted, I do think that Yiza or Yazi, he'll be in the UFC here soon. I'll probably be betting him. I thought he won that fight barely, barely. 
I, I figured if that smaller 135er can do that to Young Lee, Blake Builder should be able to do that. And then he proved me completely wrong. Blake just got utterly demolished there, nearly finished in the first round, and he showed me everything I needed to see with this kid to not doubt him anymore. A good takedown defense, good striking arsenal, uh, good finishing ability. The, the dude gets you hurt, and he has that finishing uh, instinct to come after you. And if he does end up catching a meal, I, I feel like he's going to finish a meal. He won't let him off the hook. But you can never count out a meal. I won't be surprised. And I'll tell you, I can if I put like, say, 10 grand, which I won't do, on Young Lee, I have to be prepared to know that Hyder Emil is very capable of taking that ass whooping and then bringing it and giving it back to you, Lee. Um, but what I'm thinking is that Lee's counters are just going to be too quick and too pinpoint that it's going to put uh, Hyder Emil on uh, LGBTQ street and he won't be able to recover and then he'll get finished. He might not go out, but the ref will just be like, that's enough. So I will go with Young Lee. I feel like he's going to have his breakout performance here, have his first UFC finish. Next bout, another Korean Duhu Choi versus Bill Algio. Uh, Algio minus 160, come back on Duhu Choi. Plus 135. So it's 14 and 4 for Choi. Del Algio is 18 and 8. They have a shared opponent. Funny enough, their last opponent uh, was Kyle Nelson. Uh, Duhu Choi essentially beat Nelson, but that was like pre breakout Nelson. Nelson now is like. I don't know if he's on like the best roids Canada has to offer, but he is just on a different level right now where he is just so fucking sneaky and getting these wins out of nowhere. I mean, he did rock the crap out of Bill Algio in his fight. He never put him down. I really thought that Kyle would have eventually slowed down and Bill would have taken over. But uh, when we look at the Duhu Choi fight, it went to a draw, a split draw because Duhu Choi headbutted him on the ground, which to me wasn't like a egregious headbutt. He just happened to like push himself forward and he just tapped him on the head. It is what it is. The issue with Duhu Choi is that you look at him in the sense of like pre and post. Pre Swanson and post Swanson. Pre Swanson, this kid was just running through everybody, knocking them out. He had this swagger about him. He had this confidence that he's just like, no matter what I do, I'm going to win this fight. I'm going to find the knockout. I'm going to hurt this guy. And then the Swanson fight happened. It, it didn't go his way. He got into a life and death Hall of Fame worthy bout. And then after that, he just started getting knocked out. And what I noticed with the uh, Jeremy Stevens fight, he was whipping Stevens as early. But then Stevens at that time, what year was it? Jesus, six years ago, holy shit, at that time as I'm watching that fight, because I have UFC Fight Pass, by the way, when I'm watching that, you see Duhu Choi get a little bit of adversity, and you just see that look in his eyes, as a guy that has like a psychology background, I see the confidence just leave his body, like, oh shit, it's happening again, and then he gets knocked out in the second round, pretty bad, and then the same thing with um, Jordan, He's, he drops Jordan in the first round, he's looking good, Second round comes out, Jordan's like, fuck, I got to make some adjustments. He makes the adjustments, starts landing on Duhu Choi. That confidence goes down. He, he's barely throwing anything, and then he gets knocked out. Boy, howdy. And then that fight with Nelson, he gets dropped with Nelson, but he, he improves a bit. He tries grappling. He, he should have won that fight. It is what it is. Algio, when I'll talk about him, because I want to speed this up. Algio, goofy little karate style. I don't hate it. I'm just stating it. Ain't hating, just stating he throws awkward stuff. He, 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 shit. What's funny, he throws these like front kicks. They're like, they don't, they're not even intending to land. They just, he just throws them to like gauge distance and such because he, he's going to have the height and reach advantage here by three inches and in uh, reach and like, what, three inches in height or two inches in height with, uh, with Algio. He, he's not athletic, but he has good cardio. He can put on a good pace. I can see Duhu Choi just being more dynamic than he is, but what makes me think that Duhu Choi has a good chance is that the Korean Zombie has now retired, and I've seen pictures of them training along with another guy on this card. And I do feel that if Korean Zombie now being retired, focusing on the new generation, the younger guys, although they're not that much younger, like Duhu Choi, 
and just getting them in the right mindset, you know, they can come up with a good game plan to beat a Bill Algio here. But I cannot pick against Algio because, again, with that psychology broken for Duhu Choi, and this is just my assessment of it, uh, although I do think he's, he's a good dog here because he, he still has the physical capabilities. I mean, he, he lost to Swanson, then he went on the two-year hiatus for the military for South Korea. It just took a lot out of him when it came to fighting time. That's why he hasn't really been fighting so often. But if he took that time off since the Nelson fight, which he didn't lose, right? It's not a loss. I don't know what his UFC contract looks like. But if he's here and he wants to win by any means necessary, I think he's got a good chance here. He's still got that power. He's still got the skill set with the striking. It's just that if Algio, you know, big brothers him or tries bullying him and he just kind of loses that focus and he starts feeling like ah oh, shit i'm gonna i'm gonna fall into that trap and i'm gonna lose i can see him lose focus and then be algio maybe land something goofy that maybe even hurts to who troy because his durability has kind of been waning a little bit but um if algio wants to win this fight he has to put that pressure on him just don't get countered don't get hit just just big brother him and i do think that if you can get him to the ground late he can actually tko him Come the third round that is if bill algio is still conscious i mean bill's kind of a durable dude but if you hit him just right and i think he's got the speed do who troy does to probably rock him you can put him out but my official pick is going to be algio round number three tko we'll see we'll see definitely if troy comes out here early looking like troy of old he's got like a little bit of swagger to him i would even keep an eye on his like outfits <laughs> when he's like uh uh, making like his appearances in in the apex like if you see him around vegas if you see a picture of him kind of keep an eye on his instagram because back before he he went to the swanson fight he was wearing like these little little fuck boy hats you know like oh i'm a, a oh, look at that. you know what i'm saying like he he just had like this aura about him if he's just like down to business like i'm just here for a paycheck kind of style like i've got my slacks and my baseball cap maybe go with Algio. moving on cody durden versus bruno silva OSB, here we go. Minus 120 for Durden. Come back on Silva is plus 100. Silva, MIA. Don't know anything where he's been. It almost seems like he's been waiting for Durden. They were scheduled to fight around the same time. Fucking flood. Got him. Got the motherfucker. They were scheduled to fight around the same time as um, Durden when he fought uh, Hadley. It was supposed to be Durden fighting Hadley. He was going to run through Hadley, according to him, and then he's going to fight Bruno Silva like a couple weeks later or whatnot. And from what I gather, I could be wrong about this because, again, it's not to say it's hard to find information about Bruno Silva, but when you type in Bruno Silva and what's going on with him, you get Blendado Silva, which is the middleweight because Bruno Silva, Bruno Silva. And since he's not fighting as much, there's not a whole ton of info out there on him. I might eventually hear an interview as to where the fuck he's been. But I think I saw that he's training at ATT. If that's the case, I know Durden also trains at ATT or cross-trains at ATT, where they both train with um, the champ in, in I was going to say Figueredo, in Pantoja. So I don't know if they've had rounds together, and Silva's like, I'm going to wait for Cody Durden. I'm, I'm just going to wait for Cody. Like, I I'm cool, because he knows something that we don't. But in that meantime, with that activity for Cody Durden, he's fought some good competition. He beat Charles Johnson. He fought Tajir. I mean, didn't go his way. Uh, but he's shown some definite improvements. He's going to be the bigger dude here. He is reliant on his wrestling, but not over-reliant. I mean, he can box. He has power in his hands. But I think Bruno's going to have more power. He hits harder, I think. He has really good low kicks. I think his speed and his development has really been progressed since his fight with Tajir himself, which I still think he won that fight. He's got a jiu-jitsu black belt. I mean, it's it's a very even fight on paper, given the fact that Bruno's kind of been MIA. But if Bruno is the same dude we saw against, uh, against why can't I fucking remember his name, Tyson Nam, which I remember betting Bruno, and I'm like, fuck, man, I don't know if he's going to be able to hurt Nam at all, because Nam's like an iron-chinned Hawaiian, and then he front kicks him, drops him, and take his, takes his back, and then submits him. That was like a beautiful submission, puts him out to sleep. With that kind of power, with that kind of submission ability, I can't go against the dog here in Silva. I do have to pick him to win. I, I think I can actually see him getting a submission if Cody gets maybe hurt, which he's never been TKO'd, but he's been subbed quite a bit. 
if he can rock uh, Durden and then have him shoot a sloppy shot, I can see him getting choked out by, by Bruno Silva. But I will say Durden's ability to avoid submissions, his, his jiu-jitsu has definitely gotten a lot better over the le- uh, sorry over the years. So I've grown to really respect Cody Durden's game. I mean, I think he can beat a lot of flyweights in that division. It's just his toughness, his perseverance, his his ability to level up. It's crazy to think that he lost to Jimmy Flick. And it's funny as hell to me to think that if Jimmy Flick were to fight him again, there's a chance Jimmy Flick can submit him again. That'd be fucking funny. But I do have to go with Silva. I think if Silva is still that same dude that we saw against Tyson Nam with the lateral movement, just the ability to throw fast and, and quick and just be a speedy little mouse, He's got every bit of skill that Cody Durden has. But if Cody can just outmuscle him and get on top of him, I can see him eating rounds and, and winning. It's just sometimes Cody overdoes it. He expends too much energy. And it will be up to Silva to make him expend that energy where in the third round he can just come after him Terminator style and try to finish him, try to knock him out or submit him. So I think there's a lot of upside with the dog here. Bulldog, that is. Bruno Silva plus 100. Not sure if I'll bet it. Um, but yeah, I do like Silva in this spot. I, I like both of these guys for sure. It might even be a really good live betting situation, but, uh, it's going to be a very fun, honest fight between two very evenly matched men where I think one of these men has to prove that they have just like separated themselves. Cause like, if we look at it, if I'm being honest, Cody very well have, could have with that time in the cage, just put himself way above Bruno Silva where he can game plan properly avoid any sort of submissions that he has uh, in the bag for Bruno because I don't see Bruno going for like triangles he'll be going for like our arm bars and whatnot but I think Cody's going to be wise to that Uh, so I think Bruno can really lose a lot of time on his back but if he can get back up and put pressure on Cody maybe land on Cody's chin make him shoot sloppy shots that's where it's going to be fun but yeah I'll still go with Silva I'm going to say submission in the second all right, next bout, we've got Kurt Holliba. All right, Kurt the Hurt, horrible nickname, plus 130. Come back on, God, come on now. Kanan, I know how to say Kucheski, but Kanan is a bitch. Pahia Kucheski, he is 15-2, and two, he is minus 155. So I'll be brief with this one because I'm going to talk mostly about Kucheski. Uh, I'll tell you very briefly, Kurt Holliba, can't stuff takedowns he's a dog he hits fucking hard he'll come after you he makes really bad decisions against Ogden he had a good chance to put pressure on Ogden made him uncomfortable that's kind of what led me to think that Rod Zabava was going to beat him because if you make him uncomfortable and you stuff his takedowns and you force him to strike against the cage he gets like oh shit what do I do he clinched with them and then he took got taken down and he lost the fight by top control if you can just negate his jiu-jitsu because he has nasty jiu-jitsu. You can win this fight. He's 37 years old. He's aging. Kucheski, on the other hand, he is 15-2. and two, Got knocked out by the GOAT. <laughs> the greatest of all time in Elvis Brenner. On short notice, making his UFC debut. I thought that was very unfair. Giving him the greatest lightweight of all time in Elvis Brenner. And I, I fucking mean that. Like, Brenner, I had the lowest opinion of this guy. Absolutely. Like, this guy sucks. He's not going to make it. He's the janitor of Chuto Box and what he's been doing. Even in losses, I'm like, whoa, this guy's really been improving. Like, his days of, like, training jujitsu with the mop as they tell him to clean the mats because he's not allowed to touch the mats when they're on there. It's like, wow, he really learned a lot putting rear naked chokes on that mop. But against Kruczewski, he knocks him out with, like, the craziest left hook to the temple. Like, the left hook to the left temple. Doesn't make sense, does it? It's just the, the goofiest shot. Go back and watch it. It's just the way Krzyzewski positioned his head. Just hit him perfectly, knocked him out cold. But that's not the first time he's been knocked out cold. This guy is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I think his jiu-jitsu is pretty, pretty good. I go back, you watch the fight on the Contender Series against Montatello or uh, Montello, Montello Jordan. <laughs> this dude was getting outmatched by Krzyzewski was just kind of getting walked down by him intimidating him with his striking prowess but Krzyzewski's striking defense is kind of shit he gets hit quite a bit he he doesn't defend his shots he, he's kind of poor reaction he's got really slow sloppy reflexes but he is training with the fighting nerds now which I think is a, a great spot for him 
I don't know if he's been training with the fighting nerds. I, I went back and I heard him talk about his uh, training camp when he did his interview for the Contender Series. I don't think he mentioned that. I think he's there now, which is perfect. I think they can game plan correctly. Use your fucking jujitsu. This guy fancies himself a striker, but I don't think he's that great of a striker. I think his striking defense leaves him uber vulnerable to getting knocked out or hurt. The amount of times I saw this guy get dropped, not dropped, I'm sorry, but get hit when he shouldn't have gotten hit is ridiculous. But if he uses his jujitsu here against Halibaugh, no problem. You got this, brother. You got this. At minus 155, like I'm willing to even take a shot on it, but I know the, the risk when it comes to him. But training at the Fighting Nerds, and I do hold that camp pretty high because the way they game plan, like they're all undefeated in the UFC currently. I know one of the guys lost in the Contender Series, but that was neither here nor there. But their ability to like pinpoint, especially Kyle Bohalio, I think if, if he is doing training with him, he'll be like, use your fucking jiu-jitsu. Your striking kind of sucks. We'll work on that later. Don't do anything stupid against Holiba, and you're going to win this fight easily. To me, my impression of this guy is that Krzyzewski is that he, he likes to intimidate his opponents by, like, walking forward. And he can he throws hard. Don't get me wrong. Like, he can strike. But his defense, to me, is just such a liability that if Kalaba just says, all right, you want to go down, because Kalaba will do that. He'll be like, fuck you. Let's go. Like, tough Louisiana swamp trash. He'll go after it. It's at that point if he decides, I want to strike with this guy, it's a 50-50 chance he'll get knocked the fuck out. I've seen this guy in his, his recent loss. Let me check it out. Give me one second. I want to see his name. I think it was like Lapalus. Damon Lapalus or some shit like that. I want to bring this point up. At one point, he lost to a guy. Yeah, Damon Lapalus at Aris FC4. This dude is like 17 and 18. And this guy put it on lap uh, on, on Krzyzewski. He beat him pillar to post. I only saw a clip, like multiple clips of it. And the way he was beating this guy's ass was like a huge red flag for me. I'm like, why is this nobody beating Krzyzewski, a guy with a better record, allegedly better skills? And I think it's just mainly that. He, he tries to fancy himself a striker. And he got outstruck by a guy that uh, luckily for him was on steroids. He lost that by a five-round decision. His... Cardio seems to be fine. It's just primarily his, his striking defense is not UFC caliber. I think he's more than likely going to get caught again. Because, like, even in the in the fight with the... Uh, I'm talking way too much about this guy. Because, like, I just got frustrated finding out when I saw that clip of him getting dominated by this uh, 17 and 18 guy. Because, like, when I saw that fight with with uh, Brenner, they were talking the... the, the that fucking fly didn't die, motherfucker. The commentary was like, wow, Krzyzewski's doing all this great job. Oh, my God. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's getting hit every time he moves forward. I'm going to pick him to win by a decision, possibly even a submission. It just, I want to see him perform. That is it. I want to see him show me that you got a good game plan. Show me that you're not this dumb meathead that just wants to strike with guys, especially guys that have reckless power that can put you out. So I will go with Krzyzewski by a decision. I think he is the better fighter when he chooses to be the better fighter. And Holaba just can't stuff fucking takedown. So I'll go with Krzyzewski to win this one by a decision. He should win this one by a submission, though. He absolutely should. Moving on. Another bout I have opinions on. We've got Steve Garcia versus Sung Woo Choi. Um, plus 120 for Choi. Come back on Mean Machine, minus 145. To be brief, I like Steve Garcia. I really like Steve Garcia. I pick against him almost every time. But Steve Garcia is a dog. He moves forward. He tries to... Man, when, when I say his ground and pound is vicious, it, it almost seems like the, the Mexican narcos, the mafia is like, take care of him. And make sure he can't have an open casket funeral. And he's like, you got it. And he, he never disappoints. He goes after dudes with elbows. He's vicious. He's absolutely vicious with his pressure. His boxing attacks a body well for a southpaw. Gets hit almost every time. And he gets dropped a lot. He, he gets either knocked out, get put on his ass. He gets wobbled. I went back and watched the fight 
with a short guy in which Chinese fellow was it? Nurdenbeka. Nurdenbeka put him out cold, and then the ground woke him up. The fight with um, Ontiveros, another tall guy, he got hit with the toes of Ontiveros, and it put fucking fly. It put Steve Garcia in, in wobbly Bambi legs. He got countered as he was rushing in for a takedown. Nearly got finished again against Charlie fucking Ontiveros. <sighs> Man, it's it's nuts. I actually really do want to see a Steve Garcia versus Chase Hooper rematch at lightweight. I'm very curious how those two would match up again. If maybe at this point uh, the then 300 favorite Chase Hooper can actually get a bit of revenge on Steve Garcia. Um, that's the main thing with Garcia. If you don't put him out, he will find you and he'll beat the shit out of you. Sung Wu Choi, to keep it brief, because I can talk about my thoughts on Choi for a good hour, but I think he's been making slight improvements with his overall game. I think that the Erosa knockout, where he bum rushed him and knocked him out, gave him this sort of like absolute hard on for wanting to get vicious knockouts. Let me actually check: Did he get a performance bonus bonus for that? Let me make sure. That would actually explain a little bit more. He did get a performance bonus. So imagine that. Imagine you're this this new that damn fly. You're a new kid from Korea. You just got a performance bonus. You got a highlight reel knockout over a, a veteran. And then you're like, wow, if I can do this to him, I can do this to a bunch of dudes. I have a bunch of power in my hand. He nearly did that to uh, Bruce Leroy. But, you know, I don't want to get into that. He ended up getting submitted. And then he tried to do that to Trezano. I think that was his next fight. And that did not go well for him either. He actually got... Uh... No, that no, that was Josh Kulabau. Josh actually dropped him. Josh completely won that fight, but they made it into a split for whatever reason. The next fight with Trezano, he tried to do that shit. He tried to bum rush him by being very generic. And then they both dropped each other. And ultimately, Trezano knocked him out in a very fun fight. But that, to me, was like... You, you had that false confidence that, hey, if I just bum rush, these guys are going to go down and hit the ground. His fight with Jarno Aarons, and I'm going to try to keep it brief because, again, I feel like I'm going to talk more about him. He got hit with his best shot. Aarons has a very nice leaping uppercut that's knocked dudes out in the regional scene, like a Max Koga or some shit like that. Very good uppercut. But in that fight, it showed me that Sung Woo Choi has, like, matured. He's no longer actively going berserker mode. I do think that he can get a little complacent where he throws the same combination over and over, like jab, right hand, high kick. Most of the time he he lands, um, he ends a combination with a high kick. And I feel like you can counter him there. But with the Korean Zombie retiring, again, he's another guy that's been in his radar. They've been working together. I feel as if he can improve enough to be patient he does have decent enough takedown defense. He can actually get takedowns of his own. His chin, I don't think it's a big liability. I, I think it's more so his recklessness that has caused him to get dropped and in one case finished. I think that his uh, defense is more so his, um, his problem when he gets too crazy reckless. I think if he maintains his distance, he's calm. He definitely has better defense. He's just as big as Steve Garcia. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm going with him by knockout in the first round. I, I just feel like at this point, Steve hasn't changed. He's still the very aggressive dude. He doesn't present anything other than just being a violent tornado, violent Mexican tornado. Not, I love it. I absolutely love it. But it does leave him vulnerable to get sniped, to get dropped. And I think if Sung Woo Choi just plants his feet and just counters with a nasty little right hand or a checked left hook, Steve will hit the ground. And I think Sun Wu Choi has the patience and takedown defense to stuff the takedowns of Garcia and just start blasting him. Because if you look at what happened with Ontiveros, he hurts him, but Ontiveros couldn't stuff the takedown. We see with, um, with Nurdenbeka, he gassed himself out and he just could not stop the onslaught of Garcia. We see with uh, Melky, Melky just fought like a fucking clown that day and he got utterly demolished which he deserved and we saw what happened to him in the next fight he seemed to have like his wits about him like oh i'm a much better fighter i mean i guess he just really wanted to show us his uh his grappling that day but 
oh, poor Melky, man. He got fucked up. <laughs> but yeah, I think Sumbu Choi is a very good chance here against Steve Garcia. Because like, if you're going to say, oh, yeah, Steve's going to run through him, very likely. Is Steve going to run through him and not get hurt? That's a different story. Whether he gets hurt and finished or hurt and comes back and finishes Choi, I'm willing to take that chance. I, I just suspect that Choi, the little little positive things I've heard in his last fight, he had a post-fight interview and he just really tried to get the point across. Like, I'm trying to get better. Like, he's better than what he's shown. And that, to me, resonated with me. I, I believe him and I expect him to try to show that. But if he comes out here like, I'm going to knock this fucking guy out, it's just a waste of my money. So... I'm considering playing a, a shot here on Sung Woo Choi. Next bout, co-main event, Brad Tavares versus Jung Young Park. I must add, I love me some Jung Young Park. When re-watching and taping this dude, his fight with Durayev is... Yeah, motherfucking fly. His fight with Durayev is either my favorite or maybe my second favorite fight to tape ever because I hate Durayev. He's a fucking piece of shit. But the way he handled him, and then he walked him off, choked him out. <laughs> he choked him out as he's crying on the ground. He's doing his little dance. Love me some Iron Turtle. Minus 185 here. I think it's a tough matchup for Jung Young Park because he's fighting a guy with good takedown defense. And I think Jung Young Park does his best work when he can get it to the ground and get his ground and pound off, his takedowns going. In a very clear striking matchup, it's going to be very close. I think Brad is very... Very good. He's fought good competition. He's fought former champions. He's fought uh, current champions. He's fought uh, well, Bruno Silva. Is, uh, it is what it is. But my biggest issue with Brad recently is his chin is just it has been getting tagged a lot. And although he's not getting put out cold, you can argue that about Bruno Silva. I still think he's got the wherewithal, the striking ability, the durability, I would say, to beat Jung Young Park, at least make it very close. Can Jung Young Park win this on the feet only? Yeah, he's got a very good jab, very good jab, very good boxing. He's he's quite quick for a five foot ten middleweight. I mean, I love me some Iron Turtle. I can't stress that enough. I would want him to win, but when I'm breaking this down, if he can't get takedowns, he can't definitively put a stamp on these rounds. If it becomes like a clinching affair where Brad disengages, throws kicks, and keeps him at distance, where he will be the taller guy with longer reach, he has better kicks, in my opinion, low kicks, for example, he can point fight the shit out of Jung Young Park and just make it close, possibly win a 30-27, more than likely a 29-28 at plus 155. I think this is a good chance for Brad. He trains with a good team, trains with the former champ, and Jung Young Park, not to say anything negative about him and his training camp, but when I look at the people he's fought, they're not the greatest people. Joseph Holmes, for example. Where the, f the hell's going on with Joseph Holmes? Actually, let's find out. I have piqued my own curiosity at ugly man Joseph Holmes. I wonder, did he ever get a UFC win? I'm super curious. Oh, yeah, he beat Alan Amadovsky. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, uh, he lost to Jamie Pickett. He has not... He actually is fighting Elias Urbina, which I'm assuming is uh, Gilbert Urbina's brother. The fighting loser Urbina's. But yeah, um, Eric Anders arguably lost a round, nearly got finished by Jamie Pickett. That's a bad sign. Joseph Holmes, Dennis Tolulin, and Albert Durayev. I mean, I'll give it to to, to Tolulin, like, I'm not going to shit on uh, Durayev enough because I want it to seem like a good win for Jung Young Park, but uh, Durayev is kind of doo-doo. But uh, yeah, that Muniz fight, it was interesting. I, I barely gave it to Muniz, but this is not anywhere close to that kind of a matchup. On the feet, I think it's going to be very close. I think Brad Tavares has enough to win. I think with the reach advantage, he might just be able to pull it off here. I am going to go with Tavares by a decision. This could go either way on the feet, though. I think Jung Young Park does have enough power to hurt Tavares, but maybe not finish him, but definitively win rounds like that. Um, this would be a sad day if we find out that Tavares is just not the same dude because of all the CTE. I don't want to get into that, but if Jung Young Park beats Tavares, which I'm, I am hoping that happens, I want to see Jung Young Park hold that middleweight title and beat uh, Drake Estuplessis for it, bring it to Korea. That'd be dope. But yeah, I'll go with uh, Jung Young Park 
to lose a very close decision to Brad Tavares. All right, main event. Lemos versus Janjaroba. Now, I could spend forever talking about the the issues with both ladies. I mean, Lemos, good striker, good submissions, sometimes very difficult to get back up from the ground when she gets taken down. She's given up in total in her last two fights, eight takedowns. Um, six of those came to the champ in Wiley Zhang, which is like, we'll, we'll get to that number in a bit. And two of those uh, came from Mackenzie Dern in her last fight, where she barely edged it out. But when she hit the ground, it was lackluster. She couldn't really do much. Um, there were points where she even got swept by Mackenzie Dern. Um, Jan Jaroba, she goes all out for her takedowns. She's been just nonstop with her takedown ability, getting girls against the cage, getting them down, just controlling them. And on top of that, um, terrible striking. She has decent enough striking when she doesn't have like a major threat on the feet, but uh, she's not opposed to just rushing in for a takedown. It's uh, minus 135 for Janjarova, plus 100 for Lemos. I'm going to give you my main point as to why I'm going with Lemos in round number three, TKO. The reason being, Janjaroba's never been five rounds. Lemos has. Janjaroba, if you do not engage her in any sort of grappling, you, you don't even play that, and you have the good footwork to avoid her sometimes telegraph takedowns, you can make her very uncomfortable. In the first round, she's going to come out like a bat out of hell. She's never been finished. So I, I don't expect her to not have any issues just shooting for a takedown against Lemos. When I saw the fight with, because I taped all of her recent fights, I, I taped the fight with Godinez, where I think Godinez essentially just played her game and, and she lost. But it showed that she can take down a very good wrestler in Godinez. Her fight with Rodriguez just dominated her. Rodriguez has negative takedown defense these days. And she just pushed through, ended up winning that fight really easily. Angela Hill, same thing. She was just able to dominate her on the mat. The issue with the Amanda Rebus fight, she instantly went for a takedown in that fight. She, she won. She had what appeared to be decent enough striking, and she even dropped Hibas. But in that fight, she had no fear of Hibas because like she just saw like if I drop her, I, I can I can just come out here, strike with her, and drop her, possibly finish her, which she had that confidence in her when she dropped her and nearly finished her. Come second round, Amanda Hibas started getting on her bike using good footwork, and Janjiroba just could not get her to the ground. She could not find her. She was shooting from a mile away. She was just really, really awkward. She even did a couple bad uh, takedown shots against Marina Rodriguez, but Rodriguez was just so frankly, moronic that she couldn't land a knee. She just she just was too afraid of getting taken down, but Janjaroba was come through the third round just telegraphing everything. You can say, well, she can still take down Lemos. Yes, she, she definitely can. What I saw from Lemos in her last fight with uh, Mackenzie Dern, that movement that she had, just stifling Dern and then just sniping her from away was impressive. You know, yeah, Dern did eventually get her down and dominate her, but she still did enough to win those rounds where she caused a lot of damage. I think that Janjaroba is also more capable of gassing herself out because of how desperate she is to kind of hold her opposition down. Like, she wastes a lot of energy trying to get these girls down. She goes max effort on these takedowns. And with Lemos, I think her takedown defense is good. It's just sometimes she, she gets caught, she gets dropped, or she gets taken down. Like the, the two times she got taken down by Dern, I believe, were from a slip from a caught kick. And I think uh, I think she might have gotten dropped by Dern because she has that big titty power that I love so much. But she still, in my eyes, did enough to you know survive on the mat. I think that's when it, what's really going to help her. She survived on the mat with Wiley Zhang. And granted, Wiley took her down six times. But even late in that fight, and that's why I'm like, yo, I think Amanda might be underestimated with her cardio. She didn't look bad. She was a little flat-footed, but she was still able to get back up at certain occasions against Wiley Zhang, the champion. She's been the five rounds. 
She's, she's felt that type of cardio before. She's felt the best of the best dominate her, and she survived it. She fought Mackenzie Dern, a very dangerous and lethal jiu-jitsu practitioner, in my eyes, more dangerous and lethal than Janjiroba, with her submission ability, and she passed that, and she won. I think she is more than capable of coming out here, getting on her bike, sniping Janjiroba, maybe giving up a takedown in the first round or two, but come the later rounds, she'll be the more fresher girl, and she has legitimate one-punch knockout power at straw weight. For that reason, I think in the later rounds, like round number three and beyond, if it even gets to that point, because Amanda can come out here early and just starch this girl, fix her fucking eye. Oh, I feel bad now. But <laughs> Jandroba, I get the, the plus 135 favorite. I get it 100%. If she can get takedowns repeatedly and not get tired, well, shit, we're, we're screwed here. But with the submission ability of Lemos, her power, her speed, her footwork, her dynamic striking... I think she's more than capable of winning this fight in multiple different ways. And I actually trust her cardio more than I actually trust Jan Jarobas, who is more dependent, again, on holding her opponents down, opposed to Lemos, who can just coast and survive on the mat. Yes, she'll get tired, for damn sure. I just don't see Jan Jaroba doing anything that poses such a huge threat to, to Amanda Lemos. That she's going to be like, oh no, I'm gassing out trying to... Trying to get back up. I think she's got enough power to get back up. So I will go with oh, I'll go with Lemos with round number three TKO. But yeah, let me know what you think in the comments in regards to this card, what you think about betting. Again, I, I am looking at that uh, fight between Usman and Peterson. I just get a bad feeling about Peterson. I don't want to get into too much detail, but I just don't think he is ready. I don't think he poses much of a threat to Usman. Uh, so hopefully by the time I get to the casino, those odds aren't like ballooned up, ballooned up like the uh, muscles on Usman from EPO. But yeah, let me know what you think in the comments, Johnny Tiger Bomb MMA. I will catch you next week.